I've no doubt that a number of you know or know of Simon Minahan. Simon practices in commercial law um, with a particular emphasis on intellectual property and uh, IT and insolvency. Um, he has a master's law in intellectual property and information technology and uh, for many years I remember reading his articles in the newspapers that I always found amusing on um, IT law. Um, he uh, has extensively advised and consulted on supply and implementation and licensing contracts for private corporations and entities, government departments and so forth. Um, Simon has extensive experience in litigating and in mediating uh, disputes in uh, corporations, law and commercial law matters and contractual and trade practices disputes. And uh, he's on the WIPO panel for domain name disputes as a panelist. Um, an interesting jurisdiction in itself. So without further ado, Simon will talk to us in relation to exemplary damages. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning. Now, um, we go from the uh, salutary and general to the very particular and um, given we're here under the heading of commercial remedies, um, somewhat marginal question of exemplary damages. Uh, and I was moved to consider this and speak to you this morning about it, in part by um, recent headlines, which I'm sure uh, have come to your notice, uh, in a case where uh, Ms. Fraser, uh, Kirsty Fraser Kirk has commenced proceedings against David Jones, the board of David Jones, and uh, in particular Mr. Uh, McInnes, uh, in the federal court. And the reason why, um, apart from it obviously um, being of some interest generally because of uh, David Jones' position in our commercial lives, um, but what obviously attracted everyone's attention is that the claim carries a, um, a figure being sort of $30 million for damages, uh, which is um, an unusually large number for an Australian jurisdiction. Uh, that obviously caught everyone's eye, but what also caught my eye was that the case has been brought in the federal court um, under the Trade Practices Act for misleading and deceptive conduct, together with claims for breach of contract, <laughs> breach of duty as an employer, and finally for trespass to the person. The claims about a sexual harassment, uh, alleged se sexual harassment, as we're all aware. And um, that struck me as an unusual blend, if you like, particularly the misleading and deceptive conduct, but it also um, resonated somewhat because uh, as commercial lawyers I think we realise or we constantly confront claims that are brought under uh, many heads of which misleading and deceptive conduct is um, usually involved. It doesn't take great amounts of invention to bring it in as a backstop or cover-all uh, and it's always, often used as a way of getting yourself into the federal court, if that's the jurisdiction you prefer, which it seems in this case um, the lawyers acting for Ms Fraser Kirk prefer because of the wealth of industrial and employment law experience in that jurisdiction. Uh, so what struck me was that as commercial lawyers we may well run into um, some of these issues and these sorts of claims, which are not necessarily day-to-day -day for us, not routine. And so I thought it might be an opportunity to revisit just what the parameters are for an exemplary damages claim and um, some of the principles involved. Uh, and 
the first point to note, I suppose, is that they have a fairly venerable um, history and they've enjoyed many names which are perhaps revealing. Um, they've gone by the, uh, the more bland, exemplary or additional damages, um, a term that's still applied uh, in statute, certainly in the intellectual property area. But they're also known as punitive damages, which is a bit more revealing, and um, elsewhere I think they've been styled as vindictive damages in the past, which is um, delightfully colourful. Uh, and what that sort of appellation, particularly punitive, um, indicates is that um, there are some elements to it which are, um, if you like, more familiar or at least the, the principles are more familiar to us from realms such as intentional torts and criminal law. And that's perhaps unsurprising since they've developed in conjunction largely with intentional torts, but it's worth unpacking them a little. Um, McGregor on damages has a classic citation, or at least a classic passage that's often cited, uh, which recites what I've just said, and namely that they're known as punitive, vindictive, exemplary, etc. Um, and that they are applied only where the conduct of a de defendant merits punishment, or where it discloses something such as fraud, malice, violence, cruelty, insolence, or the like. In particular, and this is picked up in many decisions, what they look for is a contumelious disregard of the plaintiff's rights. Now, um, Elizabeth and David both mentioned at the outset that we need to consider at the very outset of our dealings with clients what it is they're looking for. And certainly in the intellectual property area, it's often the case that um, one is confronted with a wrong um, which has scant or um, fairly nominal redress in terms of damages. You know, you might be on a measure of a licence fee or something similar um, for something like an architect's plan which is not infrequently measured in hundreds of dollars. Uh, <clears throat> but the sense of um, aggrievement in the client is obviously disproportionate to the, to the commercial reward. And um, it may be that in those circumstances, if one can find a way, exemplary damages will answer the case so long as the conduct of the defendant is um, such that it justifies the aggrievement. Um, and a case like the um, Fraser Kirk case is an example, albeit a fairly extravagant one, of what a bit of creative thinking might be able to do. So, uh, you need to have a defendant who has acted in a way that merits sanction. And um, the authorities say, well, what we're looking for in these damages is not the usual rule of compensation, but the object of such damages is to punish or deter, again, terms redolent of the sort of criminal field. Um, and occasionally, it is said, it's to uh, assuage the desire for vengeance, something that is by no means limited to criminal uh, litigation, as I'm sure we're all aware. It's very often a fairly serious motive in commercial uh, litigation and transactions, the desire to avenge oneself upon one's uh, uh, wrong or competitors or those you believe have done you wrong in the commercial environment. Uh, and that becomes interesting uh, as we'll discuss later on because it, it's a ground um, which is available sometimes when others have fallen away. So um, there is a moral outrage component as I've described it in the paper, namely this contumelious disregard of insult or adding insult to injury if you like. Um, there is also a mens rea component in as much as, like deliberate torts, tort, intentional torts, um, there has to have been a conscious element to the act that you're complaining of. 
so that if someone does it unconsciously or under some form of compulsion, um, it's not going to be available. However, it's not necessary to show malice. It might assist you, but it's not a, a feature or a, um, a requirement of the cause of action that one show malice, and the High Court ruled on that some time ago. Um, in essence, those are the two components that one looks for for exemplary damages. And um, then one has to look at where it's available. Now, classically, it is available in relation to tort. So trespass of all sorts, conversion and debt new, um, negligence, nuisance, and the range from malicious prosecution down to some of the more industrial torts, such as inducing breach of contract or interfering with um, trade or business by unlawful means. And again, that may be an avenue where um, there is some scope in commercial matters to consider um, broadening the range of claim and thereby broadening your um, range of remedies. Uh, and then it also extends through the uh, what I'd call the intellectual property tort, such as deceit, um, passing off. Uh, conspiracy uh, is an interesting ground as well um, and has been used in uh, very commercial situations where um, I think the largest award of, uh, that I can find that's ever been made in respect of exemplary damages was made under the grounds of a conspiracy to um, adversely affect the commercial interests of some parties that were involved in a merger with a Chinese corporation. Uh, and in that case, it's uh, the case of Chen. Um, and I'm not sure if I cited it or not. Chen and Karen Donis, it's a 2002 decision in New South Wales. Um, yes, they used a, a company that had been in financial difficulty, did a merger with uh, some, it was a shoemaking company. Mr. Karen Donis had built up for his life. He got into financial strife. He refinanced with some Chinese partners and moved his manufacturing to China. And the Chinese partners um, essentially paid out debts of the company and then took equity on the basis that they were providing um, facilities in China. But they then proceeded to, uh, and gave him an interest in, a 20% interest or 40% interest with his partner in the new vehicle, which was the Australian trading arm. But they then proceeded to uh, transfer price by selling the shoes from China to a separate company in Australia at a, an inflated price so that all the profit went in that transaction and then traded on to the company in which Mr Karen Donis had his interest and he fast went broke. Um, and he sued them for it. And one of the grounds was that they had together all conspired against him to um, basically bilk him out of his interest and his share. And that was upheld and exemplary damages were awarded in the sum of $300,000, which um, was considerably more than his original investment. So it's not, um, while it's not necessarily obviously available in commercial transactions, it's with a bit of creative thought, it's not necessarily out of the picture either. Classically, it's not considered in contractual disputes. It's uh, not doesn't form part of the Trade Practices Act uh, remedies because they are based on uh, compensation, on cause, whereas um, obviously exemplary damages or punitive damages are uh, a matter of um, ind indignation rather than uh, compensation for a loss caused by any act. Um, there are some rumblings in some cases that the, there is no logical reason why the principle shouldn't extend into contract. Um, and there is some overlap in the thinking between exemplary damages and aggravated damages. 
which are a form of compensation, um, which allow for a higher award where the conduct has led to, uh, I suppose, loss of reputation is a classic one, um, loss of uh, enjoyment where the contract might have been one for enjoyment, such as the, the travel ticket cases or the, um, the, the sea cruise cases. And um, in um, the High Court, in a minority judgment in, uh, sorry, Justice Brennan in ACP and you read on the insurance, um, expressly says, I don't understand why we don't have this head of damage in relation to contract. Um, so, uh, and there are discussions uh, by Justice Wilcox in um, New South Wales decision, which I have cited, uh, I think it's footnote eight in the paper, um, Flamingo Park, although his discussion is really flavoured more as a discussion of aggravated damages. So by way of um, continuing to justify the topic, um, there are significant damages available and they can be accessed in commercial matters. There is some um, appetite, it seems, judicially for perhaps expanding classic categories, but it, it wouldn't be an easy task and you'd want to be able to find um, another route home than trying to persuade the courts that after a, a lot of authority um, against it, there should be an allowance for it in the, the field of contract. So um, on page three of the paper, um, I've listed the areas where you typically it's considered as unavailable. Um, defamation was, and a couple of the High Court decisions did deal with um, exemplary damages for defamation, but that's since been um, reversed by statute. The um, Lord Cairns Act, which is wrongful death, um, sorts of claims under the Wrongs Act in Victoria don't attract it either. And as we've discussed, the um, Trade Practices Act doesn't, Trademarks Act at present doesn't, although there are proposals to introduce it. I'm not sure where they're at. Um, conversely, copyright patents acts do allow for it. So um, there are jurisdictional limitations and there are qualifications of um, moral outrage and um, a sort of a mens rea element. Um, and as a consequence, it's often said that the award is rare of these damages because it has to have this character. I suspect that's um, partly true and partly that it's not often sought. Um, perhaps people are, uh, don't necessarily, or practitioners don't necessarily turn their mind to it or, to, uh, or ask the question too often. Um, so how are they assessed? The, um, the introduction of the moral outrage aspect, the uh, contumeliousness or the reprehensibility of the conduct uh, is a question of degree and um, that introduces in essence a judicial discretion. It's not enough that the um, conduct itself is um, simply objectionable, it has to have this particularly um, egregious quality to it. Um, and that is not only a, a qualifying issue, but it's obviously a matter that gets tipped into the, the process of coming up with the number. Uh, it's said in some cases that it doesn't necessarily bear any relationship or proportion to compensatory damages which might be awarded in the same case, which is true up to a point in as much as it's a different question. And very often um, in the cases and I've listed some of the High Court decisions at the rear of the paper where um, it's been an issue. Um, you know, the award of compensation might have been $5,000 or um, a couple of thousand pounds. Um, for instance, in um, XL Petroleum and Caltex, which is a fairly recent 
decision, uh, a, an employee of Caltex damaged some tanks, some holding tanks of a rival, um, and the damage itself was fairly quickly and easily fixed, and I think the bill for fixing it was about $5,000. But um, notwithstanding that there was an argument that um, the employee believed he was entitled to do it, didn't believe there was any uh, lawful impediment to him doing it, he was found to have been uh, pretty high-handed action, and uh, the original award by a jury was for $400,000 in compensation by way of exemplary damages, which as far as I'm aware is the highest award that's been made. It was quickly reduced on appeal to $150,000 and then that itself went again to the High Court where, and in fact this is the case where Brennan says why shouldn't it be a, um, available in contract as well as in uh, tortious matters. But he and um, unsurprisingly Lionel Murphy said well, we're not going to interfere with that award and frankly I don't know that we should have interfered with it at the appellate level. Um, the jury is entitled to come to whatever figure it likes and it doesn't need to bear any relationship to the actual uh, compensatory element. Uh, having said that, the, um, it does bear some uh, relationship and there is some proportionality in as much as in, certainly in the intellectual property sphere, where the damages for compensation are slight, um, the courts consider that a, a basis, a, or at least an incentive, to award additional damages because the, the compensation awarded itself doesn't sufficiently carry the disapproval that the court would like to express. Uh, and in fact, that is stated in authority on a number of occasions. The bigger the award, the more likely that the needs for deterrence, punishment uh, and assuaging of vengeance or vengeful motive um, is met by a large award for compensation. So again, if you're in a field where perhaps your um, uh, standard damages aren't going to be large, then you're also in the territory where if the behaviour is poor, you, you may well be able to um, pump up the tyres, as it were, of your claim by, by pursuing exemplary damages. Um, the other, one of the other considerations uh, is the means of the defendant. And uh, again, it's perhaps counterintuitive that that's considered because it's not considered necessarily from the point of view of um, the classic sort of plea in a criminal case where you say, you know, my bloke's unemployed and he can't pay a $10,000 fine, can we do something to deal with it? Uh, again, in XL Petroleum, one of the justifications for the large award was we're dealing with Caltex. They make a lot of money and we want to make sure that this um, award and this message that we're sending by this measure bites and bites hard and therefore the high number. And um, <clears throat> that brings me back around to the Fraser Kirk case where um, the $30, $35 million claim is expressed as 5% of David Jones' earnings. And it's designed as a number to reflect something which David Jones would feel and which would send the message of deterrence. Um, mindful of the time and um, having given you a paper, I'll just make one final observation concerning it, um, which is, just going out of my head, good. <laughs> the desire in um, the award of these damages to punish uh, is a key feature and there is no logical reason in particular why that can't extend or at least be applied in concert with standard commercial remedies and we, I believe um, while there is uh, probably limited opportunities, those opportunities are not often identified or used. I guess the final thing to say is that uh, amongst the um, 
criteria or the discussions about how one assesses these damages, there is a, um, a number of uh, exhortations by courts not to be extravagant, um, which seems to be something that perhaps Ms Fraser Kirk's lawyers have decided to overlook or perhaps their, um, their interests in extravagance are somewhat um, not, not exactly aligned with those of the court. Um, <clears throat> so have a think on it. Um, bear it in mind when you've got a case where perhaps there are reduced uh, scope for compensation but there is pretty poor conduct and an angry client. Um, and have a nice day. Thank you. Um, any questions in relation to exemplary damages or any question in relation to Liz, Liz's paper and address? One over here. I just want uh, to reconcile the proposition that the agreed contract and agreed parking should be put into the arms they were but for the breach. Um, and then you're saying exemplary damages may be ahead in commercial disputes all of a sudden potential windfall argument for the agreed parties <coughs> if they get the temporary damages. Well, uh, at present, there's nothing to reconcile because the jurisprudence for contracts says you can't have that. It's akin, I suppose, to a penalty argument. But um, the social element of exemplary damages is not concerned with the compensation or with necessarily giving a um, defendant a windfall, and that was the point that escaped me for a moment. Um, there, there is a case uh, involving uh, a motor accident in New South Wales. Well, it wasn't really a motor accident. A guy drove off with a process server had served a bloke who took exception and started to chase him in his car and jumped on the bonnet and hung on, and the process server did that till he fell off and kept going. It turned out he broke both his legs and he was in some pain. And um, subsequently he was sued and exemplary damages were unsurprisingly considered and awarded. But in that case, it was a compulsory insurer scheme and the argument was, well, who's this going to punish or deter? This bloke isn't going to pay a cent of this. It'll wind up on the insurer's head. And the response was, yes, well, that's true, but um, it'll deter any feelings for vengeance. And so the award was made. Uh, <clears throat> but that means, that very clearly says, that these are not about and have no bearing on compensation, but it's an opportunity for us to say we don't like this kind of conduct and it's antisocial and we're going to make statements about it. Well, there is no reason on that basis why it shouldn't be available in relation to any conduct that answers that character or has that character any time the courts are seized on it. That's the logic, but at the moment the jurisprudence is you can't go there. Any other questions? Lady here. Simon, I was going to ask you about the extravagance of the David Jones claim mm. and the stratagem that might be behind that, because it is extravagant and it obviously draws a lot of attention. It certainly tells David Jones that she's not going to settle for peanuts. Mm. And it, it presumably brings them to the bargaining table and, and they have a mindset whereby they realise she's probably wanting more than less. Um, if that stratagem doesn't work, is it also likely to perhaps have an adverse effect on the perception of the claim by the court? I think it already has had that. My, my guess would be. Um, and the danger is it trivialises what's otherwise a pretty important question for corporate life in Australia by, by bathos, by, by exaggerating. I mean, the, uh, one of the lead cases in America in this field was relating to a Ford uh, car that was released with faulty petrol tanks, which would have cost $11 to fix, was the evidence, per car. And Ford made the decision to just settle cases, which they did the maths and thought it would be cheaper. And of course, someone got hit in the back and then the car blew up. And the original award was for 120 something million, I think, which was reduced to three and a half million in America by American courts. Now, if that case 
attracts three and a half million by way of exemplary damages. It's pretty hard to see an Australian case where the highest award I can find that has been maintained is $300,000 in the case of Chen. Um, it's pretty hard to see that being maintained, I would have thought, or, or, or anything like that number being approached in an Australian jurisdiction. So I think it's about publicity. I think there's a, an agenda there. It's about putting the case right up front, partly to put pressure on David Jones, perhaps, but partly also um, to ventilate the issue because of the grievance, the sense of grievance in the plaintiff. Um, one hesitates to suggest that there's any collateral benefit for the law firm, but perhaps there is. Anyway, I'll stop there. An outrageous suggestion. Any other questions, comments? No? Well, thank you very much. Can I ask you to thank our speakers in the usual way? Thank you. Thank you.